I wanted to start with the first talk of actually just looking back on what we've done in the last five years as a core and um, a little bit of a reflection on what has been 18 years of being the Bioprotection Research Centre. So, oh, and don't forget the hashtag. And, and Margaret, lovely photo of gumboots, thank you. <laughs> so just a quick recap on why our area is so important. And I think John put it very eloquently that basically New Zealand is an agricultural exporter we trade on both our natural and environmental beauty and our produce. And so the top line there for me is the most important. It's, and it is the question of why have a core in this area? Why have a centre of research excellence in plant protection? And it's because New Zealand is unique. So even though we have exotic plants here, our combination of our soils and our environment, the plants we grow, the pests we have um, are unique. So no one else is going to do it for us. So with that in mind, the, um, the National Centre of Research and Excellence, uh, which now is the Bioprotection Research Centre and will be Bioprotection Aotearoa going forward, was established in 2002, uh, first uh, started in 2003. It's a centre of research and especially fundamental research and postgraduate training. So we are set up under the um, Education Act and we are funded as an education facility so we're not funded out of MB, we're funded out of the um, Tertiary Education Commission. Our current mission for this last five years has been the sustainable reduction and prevention of damage to our land-based plant ecosystems from invertebrate pests, weeds and plant diseases. So very simple um, message. Some reason it's taken me two to do. One of the things that we're actually quite proud of is that over the, our, um, our life, we have continually added partners. And we started with four partner organisations in 2003. Uh, Scion joined us in around 2013. In this last few years, uh, both Otago and the University of Canterbury have come on. And going forward, we're adding four more institutes in New Zealand. And so we're starting to really cover the majority of the um, research institutes in New Zealand working in our space. Now this is very significant given we didn't get any more money. <laughs> and so people have been willing to come and join us, not necessarily for, for more money, but to be part of, of the family and to be part of the effort. And the efforts of cause go beyond that small amount of money that we do get. And it's the join, joining up, it's more than the sum of the parts. A little bit about how we actually develop the program that we've got now. And it's on the back of, in 2013, uh, this is what we looked like. We were doing a lot of work in a lot of projects, but they become quite fragmented. There's, there was, a, they were all really good pieces of work, but you were not seeing that, that synergy between the projects that really a core should be. And so we had a big think about this, and we thought about how, do, how would you actually shape a program that made more sense in terms of the, where you wanted to be. So the first question is, where do you want to be? And so we looked at it and we said, what are the big questions that we could work on? First one, what makes an organism a disease? And it, it was around the time of PSA. Why was that strain of Pseudomonas so effective compared to all the other conspecifics? How do organisms evolve? And we looked at this as real-time evolution, and we'll, I'll give you an example of this later, but basically, it's happening all the time. How is that driving plant protection? Then, why are some species invasive? Why is New Zealand suffering from some weeds, for example, and not others? Why are some of our insect pests big pests and, and not their conspecifics? And then finally, and this is a, an important area for us, is how do all these organisms interact? So rather than just thinking you're gonna go kill a pest, what happens in that entire environment and how do you make that better? So we broke that up into um, seven projects. And these, these were large multi-institute projects all set up to run for the full five years of our funding. And this is what I'll be reporting back on today at a very high level, just some examples of where these projects got to. So, Contemporary weed invasion, loss of, um, of effectiveness of a biocontrol agent, 
plant virulence and plant defence, um, enhancing beneficial um, endophytes. Why am I reading this? Because you're all quite capable of doing that. Um, we could, you could put it around several areas. So rapid evolution. So we had two projects which were really mainly about evolution. What makes a disease? We had three projects that were in some ways touching on this why are some disease, organisms disease causing and others not. We also had an overlay of making better biocontrols, but this is fundamental research and how could that lead to better biocontrol? And then the whole bit at the end of what does the whole system look like? So what I want to do, and coming this way, what you see is that our, our model for operation is fundamental research using these big teams, mainly PhD and postdoc driven. They're the engine room of what we do. Um, but then those results get taken up by our partner institutes in more applied programs, and that leads to our impacts. And of course, for any fundamental research, you're looking at impacts somewhere between 10 and 30 years out. It's very strange. Oh, there we go. Right. So I'm going to step through project by project just at a very high level of what was found. Phil Hume led this project on contemporary evolution in weed invasion. And what this was looking at is of the major theories around why weeds become invasive in New Zealand, what was actually uh, the, the case? And using Rumex as uh, dock weeds as the model system and looking at four species of dock, lots of different experiments, including some um, GBS studies and looking at uh, the plants in the UK, for example, and in New Zealand and trying to work out what was going on. A couple of take-home messages. Rumex, in one of the major species, its enemy escape they actually didn't bring their pathogens and the pests with them, and that has led to them being far more successful. It's not the case in, in all of them, and I'll come back to that in a later project. It wasn't the, um, the result of increased gen genetic admix. It wasn't the uh, result of hybridization. And so it's not that these, these weeds were, were mixing and matching and becoming more effective, but rather the stronger environmental selection pressure in New Zealand that these, these dock were able to respond to and were selected for better um, effects. And so there's a bit of increased um, phenotypic plasticity there. So, of course, five years um, of research. Anything I say is going to be really underdone, um, but if you're interested, uh, talk to Phil. And the same with all the project leaders. But it isn't just about the research that we put out. What's the, the so what question for all of these is important. So, so dock weeds can adapt ra rapidly. They're, they, they're drought resistant. Um, so they're gonna become a greater problem under climate change. They suffer less damage from herbivores and path pathogens. So we're not gonna see any sort of natural control going on at a level that's gonna make a difference, which explains why they're a, a weed now. So one of the take homes from the project is this is a perfect example where some classical biocontrol or um, inundated biocontrol where you put something on massively as a biocontrol agent is the way um, to go. The second project run by uh, Steve Goldson, led by Steve Goldson, was a really interesting one in that it's one of the few examples in the world where an introduced biocontrol agent has lost effectiveness. So this is a parasitoid wasp brought in in the 1990s from South America to control Argentine stem weevil. Did a wonderful job for 15 years or more. But when the group went back and looked at the data, which is the graph here, over, that's 23 years on the graph, the parasitoid has become overall less effective. And so the team set out to find out why and what could be done about it. The weevil is sexual, the parasitoid is asexual, the weevil has evolved a mechanism of avoidance that means it's not being pa parasitized as much, and it's quite significantly not as much in some cases. And so it's, it's patchy. Not all the populations around New Zealand have been under the same selection pressure, so you're not seeing the same outcomes. There was also um, what Steve used to call the grand experiment when he first released these parasitoids back in the 1990s, released seven echotypes collected in different parts of South America and put them out there. But they've now been doing a lot of genome sequencing of these parasitoids and they can start to tell these echotypes apart, which could never be done before. They were all, always looked exactly the same in any of the molecular techniques. 
So you can so the so what on this one is is basically can we find which of these parasitoid populations has actually survived and thrived? And so is there a, an ecotype that should be released in these other areas? It also helps to define what traits will make a better parasitoid going forward. And then there's some very interesting concepts around, uh, and Peter deaton has been leading some of this thought, around whether you can actually switch these asexuals back to sexual in containment to breed new, new lines and then switch them back to asexual and release them. And so it goes, goes all the way through for understanding biocontrol to even coming up with better approaches. Project three led by Matt Templeton, pathogen virulence and plant defense. And this was really a, uh, about um, using uh, PSA, Pseudomonas on kiwi fruit and Phytophthora on um, cowrie and looking at some of the fundamentals of disease. So why these particular strains were so effective. Looked at the epidemic origins of, of both. Um, some of it is, is a little contentious because two groups can come up with different, different um, evolutionary patterns for, for these. So w when, when Phytophthora actually emerged in New Zealand, for example, we're still unsure. There's two ways to do it. They come up with different answers. But that's good. That's science. That's what we're trying to do, um, trying to understand why you might get a different answer. Some of the other work around the evolution of PSA was more straightforward. One of the big findings there is that the mobile genetic elements, the things that jump around inside bacteria, are driving the evolution. And so it, it, it's, it's a relatively random event that will generate these strains, but it will happen. A lot of work on things like effectors. So the, the, the bits um, that are, are how PSA and the plant communicate and how that's driving uh, the virulence of these organisms. And that leads to some ideas about what you might do about it. And there's, there was also some work on Phytophthora and cowrie tissue and, and how genes express there. Obviously, this is all very high level I'm giving you, and I'm feeling a little bit too high level, but... So, where do you get from that, the so what? Um, better understanding of how these organisms are evolving in real time. Bacteria evolve fast. By, by comparison to plants. And so you've got to keep that in mind. These genes are jumping. H how is that driving? Where, where are these next diseases going to come from? What should we be worried about? And a couple of just practical things that came out of this were detection tests. So developing lamp assays for Phytophthora or PCR-based assays for uh, the Pseudomonas. This really improves field prediction and, and field modelling. And so even at that, that level, what comes out of fundamental research can really help the applied end. Project four was originally led by Barry Scott uh, before he retired um, and then taken over by Murray Cox. And, and this was the end, oh, well I say the end, <laughs> the end of the BPRC involvement with um, the grass endophytes, the epichloes, uh, which is the backbone of, of the ryegrass industry in New Zealand. Almost every ryegrass seed sold in New Zealand has a beneficial endophyte inside, which helps against pest attack, disease attack, and drought. Since, since we started as a, as a core back in 2003, we have had a strong emphasis on epichloe and trying to understand the fundamentals of how a grass inside, uh, a fungus inside a grass communicates with itself and with the grass, and how does it actually do this? So this team have been able to get to some really, really deep science and really amazing stuff. So they understand the gene pathways that the fungus is using to produce the chemicals that actually give the beneficial effect. But some even more interesting work was what they were doing around um, the nucleus, looking at not just the genome but the structure of the chromosomes and showing that where chromosomes actually touch is not random and drives gene expression. And so here's a whole new level. You know, we, we have linear DNA that we look at on the screen. That's not always going to tell you what the outcomes of that genome is because of, of the touching of, of chromosomes and, and the genes. So they've got a long way of this. It's quite an amazing piece of work at the fundamental end. So. These two discoveries, the, the, the key pathways um, analysis and, and the structure of nuclei, um, help a lot in where you go next and how to make better strains for colonising um, grasses. 
and, and not just ryegrass. The team actually made a lot more progress than they had thought at the start of this project. And I would say that was true for all our projects. When we set them up, they were very risky and every one has delivered. Um, and the work has been widely cited and has become a model system for other people working in these areas. And so huge impacts internationally. Project 5 uh, was led by myself and Mark Hurst. Um, this is about trying to enhance microbial-based biocontrol, in this case of grass grub, which is a scarab pest of, of grasses in New Zealand, with two bacteria that are known to cause a disease and there is a commercial product out there uh, and another couple coming on based on these bacteria for control. But there's an awful lot we don't know about these bacteria. And this project was a around how do bacteria interact in soil when you have a whole lot of different strains and a whole lot of variability, and in, in this case, the disease is mainly encoded by a plasmid, an extra chromosomal piece of DNA, that can, in, in theory, move between strains and not in strains. Half the strains in the field don't have the plasmid and don't cause disease. So what does that mean for the ecology of the disease? So we had uh, three PhD students work on this. And the first one looked at the variation in the plasmid itself and tried to understand the evolution of the plasmid, where, where it's come from, where it's going. A little diagram down the bottom there, which don't worry, I'm not expecting you to see, is actually the evolution of the plasmid over time. And it comes back to what you saw in what I talked about in project three, mobile genetic elements. The plasmid is basically a, a construct of bits of DNA that come in and go out and can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, including um, grass grub disease. But there are strong constraints we found on the plasmid moving between strains. So it's not promiscuous. It looks like it should be, but in the lab you can get it to go in these other strains, but we found that gene expressions changed, it wasn't as effective, or in some cases it just wouldn't happen. So the implications of this are, and there's some other work I haven't talked about basically show that the presence of these non-pathogenic strains in the soil reduces the effectiveness of the applied biocontrol agents. So you have to factor in these non-pathogenic loadings in the soil when you're thinking about applying a biocontrol agent. And there are ways to, to improve the overall effectiveness taking this into account. Project 6 was our most ambitious uh, project uh, led by Ian, Ian Dickey, and most ambitious in terms of the scope. This was our first effort to start to look and say, what happens at an ecosystem level? You know, we, we, we're quite good at this biopesticide stuff, we're quite good at this classical biocontrol. What actually happens in these different environments? And they took a few different ways of looking at this, including these rather large 180 mesocosms set up in here at Lincoln, which had home and away soils and different plant combinations of exotics and indigenous, different insects were put in there and left to run for 18 months. So it was a grand experiment and is still churning out a lot of data. There was also field work um, to complement this and some specific experiments in, in the field. So, one of the interesting ones was this, this part of the study did not find support for the enemy release. If you remember with the DOC project, they found in, in a case, one case it was enemy release that was driving the success. At the ecosystem level, that wasn't supported. So the exotic plants had a stronger interaction with the herbivores and fungi, so they could actually tolerate more herbivores and more fungi. So you weren't seeing necessarily nothing attacking it, there were things attacking it, they were just better at coping. So the land use change, um, you know, where you just um, change a forest into a pasture or um, disturb things, actually increases the diversity of the plant pathogens, for example, and th that's driven by the plant species composition increasing. So you're getting more um, plant pathogens operating in these environments. And the exotic plants showed a higher growth rate. So they were surviving these attacks much better than the natives. And then there's a spillover effect that the pathogens are building up on these exotics and then killing the natives. So there's a lot more in this project, especially. It was, it was quite a large effort. But uh, just so it basically shows the, the, the outcomes of this that um, 
the movement of species, the movement of plant species especially, uh, has resulted in a stronger and more variable interaction um, rather than interaction loss. So there's more things going on than, rather than less. So it's not a, it doesn't become a simpler system. And the, the stronger species in turn are critical for the plant invasion success. And so they're driving what's happening in those environments. So I hope I've done justice to that. Project 7, uh, firstly led by uh, Leo Condron and then taken over by Amanda Black, um, was a specific uh, iwi interaction uh, project around carry dieback. And it was around what's facilitating carry dieback, the phytophthora spread. So uh, there's only about 1% of the original carry forest left. So carry are iconic species. We've got to save them. Um, so the project was looking at how, how it spreads. One of the most interesting findings early on was that pines and grasses are acting as reservoirs for phytophthora. So it's not, they're not acting as a break, they're actually, at, it's where, where phytophthora was being found in higher numbers. Higher numbers than in natural cowrie soils. So one of, the, one of the drivers of this they found was that the microbial communities under pines was different to the, um, the communities under old cowrie forests and especially different around some of the beneficial species we know, like some of the Pseudomonas, like the Trichodermas, were less under these pines than you'd see in the Kauri forests. And so there is an element of suppressive soils that's going on that means the natural soils are reducing the impacts of Phytophthora compared to these other environments. There's also a significant difference between the communities, the general communities of fungi and bacteria around asymptomatic cowrie trees compared to symptomatic cowrie trees. So th this obviously points to a promising direction for future reduction of effect, looking at a suppressive soils of, um, approach. It also highlights the, um, the importance of disturbance. And so planting uh, destroying cowrie forests and trying to, or trying to plant them back into other environments is going to have problems. There was also a significance um, in the composition abundance of microbial genes related to carbon and nutrient cycling. So this is when you look to see how, how much carbon and nutrient recyc nitrogen sorry, <laughs> recycling is going on in, in these soils and that's obviously reduced in some of these disturbed soils. Just quickly, when we first put the program together, we had the idea that we would um, run uh, a, a sort of a, a Maori lens over a lot of what we did. I would say we were marginally successful at that. Uh, two of our projects, Project 3 and Project 7, had very strong uh, iwi interactions. Um, but we did have a few wins. We, we had a number of Maori postgraduates uh, trained during, during the five years. We help support the launch of um, the Maori Biosecurity Network. They say success has a lot, of, um, a lot of parents, so we're just one of the people who put our hands up as helping. There were a number of others. Um, obviously, the Cowrie Dieback and PSA projects had iwi links. There was also an Align project that Amanda um, did on re-indigenizing the biosecurity system. But probably one of our most lasting effects was we assembled a very strong kahui uh, led by uh, Matua uh, Hinari, and that has led to where we're going with the new program, which we'll describe later. But it's pro probably one of our more lasting effects is actually to get the right people around the table. So obviously, as a centre of research excellence, we you know we like to tout our publications, and one of the things that I am very pleased about as director is is not that we publish more papers but we published in higher impact journals year on year. And so the quality of the research in the, the, the traditional metrics went up year on year. We also, since our inception, we've published over 1,600 papers. It's always a bit weird quoting these figures because exactly, no one exactly does research just on one project. There's usually a bit of mixing and matching, so we all claim the same things. But it's, we have supported over 1,600 publications. 
a bit of a snapshot what a year would look like for us, you know, 2018, 162 news and media articles, 118 seminars, eight book chapters, co-authored um, from 30 countries on over 100 publications. So it's the quality of our research that really is important, but it's also being involved in national commentaries. It's having the team that is trying to influence policy and trying to influence thought, because that's what we should be doing as a centre of research excellence. Unfortunately, this year, uh, we've lost two of our, our alumni. Um, distinguished Professor Steve Ratton uh, passed away after a very short illness. Steve was one of the original principal investigators in the centre back in 2003, uh, so he's missed. Uh, Pierre Dupont was actually a postdoc of ours and uh, spent a lot of time in the centre at Massey University um, and he passed away in April as well, um, so it was very sad. Of course, on the other end, we have a lot of bright young things that we've cast out into the world uh, and this is really one of our major effects. So we can do a lot of really good research, but it's actually the people we train and what they can go do it later that, that will make the lasting difference in a lot of ways. And one of the things that we're really proud of is that they go into a variety of areas. You know, we've had something like nine of our graduates in this last five years go into MPI. But we also have them go into um, the uni universities, we have them go into uh, the CRIs, and we will have one of our alumni speaking this morning um, who started off as a postdoc with us and w went on to a career in plant and food. Um, but we also have people who go into industry. So it's, it's a really good mix of outcomes for us. And just finally, launching into the future. In seven days' time, I think it's seven days' time, we are launching Bioprotection Aotearoa, which has seven and a half years of core funding. Um, Amanda and I will co-lead to start. And this is, this is a real redesign of the program. This is not just business as usual. It took a, a lot of thought around what should we be working on. And it's around ecosystems. It's around getting away from trying to control a pest, one pest at a time, and how do you make more resilient ecosystems. And Amanda um, has led a group of, uh, of PO leaders, so the POs are how we will break the research up, to come up with a program that integrates a whole lot of science to try and do the really gnarly question of what makes a healthy ecosystem and how do you improve it. We also will have 11 partner organisations for the first time. And so that's a, it's really pleasing because it means we're reaching into a lot of the science in New Zealand, not just the science that we, we're funding. <laughs> right. And, and the basic way to look at this, and there'll be a lot more over these, these two days about bioprotection, Aotearoa, but the three main areas are going to be how do you define a healthy ecosystem what tools can we develop to help defend that ecosystem? And then how do you design resilient ecosystems? And so that's, that's the high level um, picture of where it'll be going. And look at that, I'm actually on time. So thank you.